have Professor Sebu Arslanyan give the lecture on From the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, the global trade networks of Armenian merchants from New Jofa. Dr. Arslanyan received his PhD with distinction from Columbia University in 2007. He is the Richard of Anisian Turk Chair of Modern Armenian History now, established by the Armenian Educational Fund at the Department of History at UCLA. He has taught at the Department of History at uh, CSU Long Beach, California State University Long Beach, as an assistant professor in the fall of 2010, after serving a year at Cornell University as a Mellon Foundation postdoctoral fellow in world history. Aslanian specializes in early modern uh, world and Armenian history and is the author of numerous articles in peer-reviewed journals such as the Journal of World History, the Journal of the Social and Economic History of the Orient, the Journal of Global History, the Diaspora, a Journal of Transnational Studies. His book entitled From the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, the Global Trade Networks of Armenian Merchants from New Jofa, Isfahan, from 1605 to 1747, was recently published by the University of California Press. It was selected by the Committee of the California World History Library as the first book to appear in their new series, Authors Imprint, that celebrates and recognizes exceptional scholarship by first-time authors. And by the way, just recently, he just won that award, that prestigious literary prize for exceptional first book from the Penn USA UC Press Literary Prize for exceptional first book. Congratulations. Well, thank you very much, Hello, for that wonderful introduction. And I'd like to thank you all for being here today and uh, ARPA for making this evening possible. Uh, my work, uh, well, I should begin by saying that today's talk is not going to be another genocide talk. Uh, my Specialization, as uh, Dr. Panosian mentioned, is early modern world history with a particular focus on Armenians. And um, obviously, uh, it goes without saying that Armenians had a, have a very rich and at times extremely brilliant history that spans for uh, several millennia. And that I think, while it is extremely important for us to continue doing work and research on genocide scholarship, for obvious reasons, we should also be not neglectful of the history that preceded the genocide and that continues uh, since then. So in that vein, uh, my work focuses on a tiny community of Armenian silk merchants originally residing in a township of Old Jufa on the frontiers of the Safavid and Ottoman empires in what is today Nakhichevan, who were uh, forcibly displaced from their region during the course of the Ottoman Safavid Wars of the early part of the 1600s, and along with approximately anywhere from 300 to 400,000 Armenians, were driven and settled inside the various regions of Iran by the Safavid monarch Shah Abbas I. Uh, in the heat of the moment, as the war was unfolding on the frontier. Now. Uh, while the three to four hundred thousand other Armenians residing in the region, on the frontier region, in the frontier region of the, the two empires, along with, of course, non-Armenians, including other Muslims and so forth, uh, uh, paid a heavy price for the deportations and their uh, 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 migration, forced migration into Iran was uh, anything but uh, voluntary movement. In the case of the merchants from Old Jofa, one can say this much. In, in comparison to the hardship suffered by the other Armenians and by the others, those from Old Jufa were given relatively privileged treatment by the Safavid monarch simply because they had already established a reputation for being savvy merchants with a global network of settlements already during the period of Old Jufa 
and specifically from at least the years 1570 or 60 until the very climax or uh, end of the settlement of Old Jufa itself in 1603, 1604. So it was the, the uh, talent uh, for world trade and their specialization in the trade in uh, long distance trade of Iranian raw silk that made the old Jufan merchants particularly attracted to the Safavid monarch uh, and contributed to his decision to relocate them and resettle them on the outskirts of his new imperial capital of uh, Isfahan, uh, which is basically, they were living right, uh, more or less around there in old Jufa and they were moved and resettled here, somewhere around here on the outskirts of Isfahan where they soon established a thriving mercantile colony named, called New Jufa in memory of the evacuated town. Now of course, uh, by 1619, uh, when an important uh, auction for the right to export and sell uh, Iran's monopoly crop, uh, raw silk, was held in Isfahan, with the participation and active help of the Safavid state, and particularly of Shah Abbas I, these merchants earned uh, the right to have a quasi-monopoly on the sale of Iranian silk, mostly to the European consumers residing in the Mediterranean basin. And it was a short step from that privilege and from the active patronage of the Safavid state for these merchants to go on and establish a remarkable feat. And that is to say, of establishing uh, one of the greatest trade networks of the early modern period, and by that I mean the period that roughly falls between 1500 and 1800. It's a term that's used by world historians. So they established one of the greatest trade networks of the early modern period with trade settlements that spanned from London, Amsterdam, and Cadiz in the west uh, to St. Petersburg, Moscow, and Archangel in the north, all the way across Europe and Eurasia, the Mediterranean, across uh, Iran, to South Asia, to Mughal India, where they had settlements in Calcutta, Surat, and Madras, to name only a few, and finally all the way to Canton, China, as well as Manila, the Philippines. Now, some of these merchants, being uh, globetrotting by nature, were not satisfied with just settling down in Manila. We, in fact, as I will mention uh, during the course of this talk, there are several uh, uh, cases that I have uncovered in the archives in Mexico City of Juven merchants who uh, were, uh, what's the term they use? Um, they, had the, uh, they had the itch to travel, and they were not uh, satisfied with just staying in Manila, so, and they took the, um, the Manila Galleon, a convoy of Spanish ships that crossed the Pacific on an annual basis, and traveled all the way to Acapulco in Mexico City. So they, are tiny, they established tiny beachheads in the New World. Uh, of course, these num the numbers of these communities were very minimal, which I'll get to in a second as well. So, in my work, uh, my recent book, recently published book, for which you can see the image here, it's also available in the back, and I think you will excuse me if I, if I since I study merchants, uh, if you will excuse me, I think that if I try to make a pitch for some of you to purchase my book, if that's possible, I would really appreciate it. Uh, now, uh, and of course, the cover alone is worth the 40 or $50 that you'll pay for it, because this is a map. This is the earliest army in Atlas, published in Amsterdam in 1695 by the Manandetti brothers. And it was an Atlas published specifically for the use of Armenian merchants. And it says at the bottom, I insisted, UC Press, I insisted that UC Press have this section at the bottom of the map, Hamadarat Ashkara tweets, in bold Armenian uppercase letters. So, $50 is worth it just for that map alone. Um, in any case, uh, my book the, uh, is a detailed economic and social history of the global network of these of the settlements established by the Jovan uh, merchants, and focus, focusing in particular on religious, commercial, and social institutions that underpin and sustain this global settlement, uh, global network of settlements for more than 100 years. In particular, it focuses on a number of issues that are uh, very germane to uh, uh, those interested in world history and particularly in economic history of the early modern period, 
yeah, questions such as the largest, the most important question, I, I believe, in my opinion at least, uh, as to how merchants, any merchants, not just Armenians, in, the, in an age before the existence of the internet, before Interpol, before the international legal system that could track down people uh, wherever they live, uh, how in this age before all of these things existed, how merchants, any merchant, actually how any merchant was able to trust another merchant to engage in long distance trade. Because it's a long distance trade, which is what the Jofans were engaged in, is by its very nature extremely prone to encourage, uh, for encouraging uh, um, embezzlement and um, improper, unethical behavior by those with whom one engages in long distance trade. And so this is one of the biggest questions my book attempts to, to grapple with. And I ask the question not only in terms of Jufun uh, merchants, but also in terms of any merchant community during that period, because the same mechanics were at play across the world. And so that's one of the issues I address. Another issue is the issue of long distance communication. How did people actually sustain such a network? And one of the reasons I argue the network survived for such a long time was because the Jufuns, like many other merchant communities during the same period, were extremely uh, competent and expert in the art of mercantile correspondence. They exchanged letters on a daily basis. Some merchants wrote up to several thousand letters. In one case, we have one merchant, luckily for us, who was uh, ar arrested in Russia in the 1720s. To be fair, he wasn't from New Juva. He was a Jufan wannabe. He was actually from uh, Karin, from Karin or uh, Erzurum. Uh, but he had spent quite a bit of time in Jufa itself. And in his case, his letters, he was traveling with thousands of letters in his, in his bags, I suppose. When he was arrested, his letters were also confiscated and they, they have ended up in several archives in Russia. So we have, uh, we have an extremely rich amount of documentation for Armenian merchants during this period, in particular for Jufan merchants. So uh, what I'm going to do now uh, is to very briefly, in the course of, I hope not more than 45, 50 minutes, give you a bird's eye view of some of the main issues my book raises and uh, attempts to resolve. And I'm uh, focusing uh, specifically on the nature and structure of the Jufan trade network, how it functioned, how it was able to maintain itself for more than 100 years, and specifically also on Towards the end of my discussion or my lecture, I will be giving you a very quick overview of uh, the engine that drove the Jufan network to expand. And that engine has to do with uh, a particular type of long distance contract, a partnership contract known in European languages as the Komenda contract and known in Jufan or Jufa dialect as the Ngeraki. So I will be talking a little bit about these matters. So, but without any Without, before I, I launch into this discussion, I feel the need to uh, say a couple of words, hopefully as succinctly as possible, on why, uh, on the question of how I framed my book, uh, what audience I chose when I wrote the book, and particularly how I came face to face with the, more, the probably the most difficult question that every every PhD student faces uh, most of the time at the early stage his or her career. And that is the question that I faced when I came back after a year of doing research, preliminary research in London. I discovered about 2,000 letters confiscated on a Jufan ship. Luckily for me, like the merchant in Russia, the ship was confiscated illegally. But luckily for us, it was confiscated for me at least because the papers of the ship, 2,000 letters, were sealed, they were packed meticulously in crates and shipped to London to be presented as high as uh, exhibits in a high stakes fund. So when I discovered these papers, I thought I hit a jackpot. This is this had never been seen before. And I thought, for sure, I have a dissertation topic. And excited after a year of research, uh, I ran back to Colombia. I was in Europe at the time. So I lived at the Vagabond for quite a few years. And when I returned to Colombia, I went straight to my dissertation sponsor. And I said, Nadir, look, I have made this huge discovery. I'm so excited. I have these thousands of documents. Never, been, never has been seen before, and I want to work on them and write a book or a dissertation on Jufa. And he listened to me very patiently, and at the end, in his characteristic fashion, he said, 
uh, you want to write a, a dissertation on Jufa, but so what? What what is it exactly you want to do? So you have to answer the question, so what, as a PhD student? Because whether we like it or not, we have to justify our research. We have to give a reason, a credible reason, why anybody who is not, in this case, an Armenian or someone from Nujufa would be interested, first of all, in reading a 500-page book on Nujufa. And for that, you have to come up with legitimate reasons and frame it in a larger context of world history to make it to make the arguments of interest to people outside of Armenian history and outside of Jofa history. And that was precisely what I chose to do. My audience, prim primarily in writing my dissertation, my book, was a larger audience of non-Armenians. It was an audience of world historians and of economic historians that specialize in Indian Ocean studies, which is uh, one of the most one of the areas of research that has been growing uh, at quite a rapid pace in recent years. And so, to answer the question, so what, I came up with at least two reasons which I outlined in the introductory chapter of my book. And uh, basically I said that the Jufans are of interest uh, to uh, a large number of readers, I hope, not just Armenians, because of two reasons. One, they are the only community that we know of from the early modern period that <coughs> successfully and simultaneously operated across all the major empires of that time period. From 1500 to 1800, all the major empires uh, had Jufans living and working through them. And that includes the three most important Muslim empires, sometimes collectively known as the Gunpowder Empires. And these are, of course, uh, Ottoman, the Ottoman Empire, Southern Empire here, and my favorite empire, hands down, of all time probably, the Mughal Empire in South Asia. The Jufans were operating across all three empires, simultaneously, and very successfully. Moreover, they were also operating across other land-based empires, such as the Muscovite Mos Russia to the north, and Qing China to the east. In addition, they are also operating simultaneously in all the major European maritime or seaborne empires that later on ended up being at the forefront of the movement of European colonialism in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Namely, the empires of maritime empires of the Portuguese, the Dutch, uh, the French, the English, uh, the, the, the Spanish, and uh, I'm probably missing one, but anyway, all the major European empires, maritime empires. So given the fact that this community, tiny, tiny community of merchants had members living and operating and working through all these empires by itself makes them eminently uh, suitable and quintessential, one may even say, subjects for world historical research. All <coughs> historians want to study communities that are by nature global, that, trans that transgress and, tra and cross multiple borders that are by very definition uh, trans-imperial, or in nowadays terms we would say transnational but trans imperial would be the appropriate term for this time. So that's reason number one. Reason number two is that, again, out of all the Eurasian communities of uh, merchants, the Jofans <coughs> were arguably the only one from the Indian Ocean Basin that has left behind a busy paper trail of documentation uh, that roughly amounts to anywhere from 10 to perhaps as much as 25,000 discrete documents in, in complete form. And these documents include, uh, they cover a broad variety of issues. Most of the, approximately 80% of the documents consist of family and mercantile correspondence. Letters between merchants, between mothers and their husbands or sons, between uh, family members and so on. So, uh, thousands of these letters. And thousands of, or hundreds of contracts, like the Comenda contract that I'm gonna be talking about, hundreds of powers of attorney and other legal instruments. So all of this, by definition, makes, again, the Jofans quintessential subjects for any historian interested in global history to be studied. And this also makes the Jufa dialect, I would argue, as one of the, one of the more important languages for the study of the Indian Ocean. Now, if a graduate student came to me, most graduate students working on in the Indian Ocean would probably begin their career by studying languages because they need you know, language training is a very important component of what we do as doc, as uh, PhD students when we begin. 
If you're going to study the Indian Ocean, chances are you're going to think, well, let me study. You're assume, you're, you should know French to begin with in English, but you would probably learn Portuguese. It's a very important language. Obviously, English. In the Indian Ocean, uh, you could learn Persian, very important, probably the most important, and so on. But mostly European languages are stressed. So my one of the arguments I have in writing this book is that the Jofun documentation is indigenous to this area. So if you want to write on, on Eurasian community merchants, uh, I don't think it's enough for you to say, well, we don't have any indigenous documentation from India or from uh, other parts of the Middle East or from the Indian Ocean. And therefore, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to rely on European documents produced by the East India companies during the same period, which is basically what happens in many of these cases where historians write on local communities. Uh, and of course, this produces a very skewed kind of image because they're relying on European documents to write the history of Asian communities. In this case, what I have to say to them is, wait, before you, you uh, throw up your hands and say there's nothing, perhaps you should spend some time and familiarize yourself with Jofa dialect because we happen to have 10 to 25,000 documents. This is not uh, a, a small matter. So that is and one other way in which I would argue Jofa history is extremely important. At the conclusion of my talk, I will also mention at least three reasons why Jofan history is important, not just for world historians, but for Armenian historians, or people interested in Armenian history as opposed to just global history. There are very valid reasons for that as well. I don't cover them in the book, but my next two book projects will be, at least the third book project will be tackling with this issue. So, uh, all right. Um, so, as I mentioned at the outset, within a short period after their deportations, these merchants established a remarkable global trade network. And they, the network basically consisted of uh, four, I have three here, but four circuits, interlocking circuits uh, in various parts of the world that were centered on New Jofa itself as the nodal center, as the center, the epicenter of the entire network. And, uh, and what uh, the first circuit is basically, and arguably the most important circuit, is the Indian Ocean circuit with its hub in Mughal, India. Now, I'll go through this map quickly one by one for the maps for the different circuits. You can see here the Indian Ocean circuit of the Jofa network with important settlements. This is New Jofa itself, the nodal center of the entire network. And we can see important settlements of the Indian Ocean world beginning with bus right here in the Persian Gulf and then moving on to uh, Surat, Calcutta down here, uh, I mean Calcutta up here, Madras, Pondicherry, and a number of other settlements. Mostly, as you can see, the dots are clustered in South Asia. And there is a very valid and perfectly uh, reasonable uh, explanation as to why most of the Jovan settlements were actually in South Asia. Uh, and we can see on the periphery of, the, of this Indian Ocean circuit, you can see, of course, settlements here in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, in what is today Singapore and uh, Indonesia, uh, as well as the important settlement in Canton, China, and Manila, the Philippines. And these, but certainly not last, I mean last, but certainly not least, we have also a Jufan, a very remote outpost of the Jufan settlements in the Indian Ocean circuit, uh, right up here across over the Himalayas and in Tibet, in Lhasa, Tibet. There was a small but fairly uh, uh, opulent Jofan community established in Tibet beginning in the 16, I think 1660s or 70s, if I'm not mistaken, and lasting until 1770. And we're not talking about very large communities here. Uh, these are, at the most, like all the other Jofan communities, we're talking about very, very small numbers. The biggest community in South Asia that the Jofans had, contrary to some uh, 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 assertions by some uh, uh, <coughs> authors or historians, the largest communities we have in South Asia during this period do not exceed 280 individuals. So Madras, for instance, 70, 70s or 80s, at the peak of its of the Jofun settlement there and of our other armies, 280 individuals, not thousands. Calcutta, likewise. All the other settlements in the Indian Ocean were actually small. Tibet, we're talking about a handful, maybe three or four or five families. So we're talking maybe in the 30s. Uh, Manila, again, in the 30s. 
The same applies for the European settlements. Never, none of, not one of them surpassed the 100. <clears throat> and someone might say, why, why are you minimizing these numbers? There are some Armenian scholars who say, well, you know, they exaggerate. There is, uh, for instance, Metrop said in his book on Armenians in India, he claims that 20,000 Armenians set foot in India between 1500 to 1800, which is actually quite clever because it's one thing to set foot and it's another thing to actually say. And even if they set foot, I don't think the number was 20,000. Because the Jufan population at its most, Jaiti by Ti was at the most 30,000. It never surpassed 30,000. Which means that if, they, if you scatter the Jufans all over the world, you're going to have settlements that are 100, 200, 300 plus. Which is actually makes their achievements even more impressive. Because despite the small numbers, what they actually accomplished is truly, uh, uh, I think, impressive and uh, uh, interesting for, for, for the time period that they were living in. Uh, we have also the settlements, the circuit in Northwestern Europe, across Russia. We have Astrakhan, Kazan, Moscow, Archangel in St. Petersburg. Uh, as well as the settlements to the west of Jufa, across the Mediterranean, beginning in Aleppo, Izmir, uh, Smyrna, Istanbul, Constantinople, Split, Sparato in today, uh, what is today Croatia, uh, and especially my favorite city in the entire galaxy, Venice, Italy, as well as Livorno itself. So. And of course, here, even here, we will see that Venice, for instance, you would think there were hundreds, thousands of Armenians in Venice, walking in the streets of Venice. Which is the impression I have, because we talk a lot about the Armenian contribution to Venice and how important Venice has been to the Armenians, which is true. But the reality is, we're not talking about thousands. We're talking about exactly 89 individuals at the, at the, at the top, at the most, at the peak of the Armenian presence in Venice. 89. In 1739, there was a census taken in Venice. I have a photo of it from the archive. There were 89 individuals registered in the census as Armenians. Perhaps if you add the monks on the island, you might have a hundred something, but we're not talking about thousands. Same with Absalom. Uh, and then we have the last court, the last circuit of the Jofen settlement, uh, the network, which is in Northwestern Europe, in London, Paris, in Amsterdam, and of course down here in the Mediterranean, still, which, I, which wasn't in the earlier map, uh, settlement in Marseille. These are very old settlements beginning in the 1620s. Even Paris, 1660s. And at the outpost, just like Manila, at the outpost on the frontier of the Indian Ocean, we have on the frontier of the Mediterranean Sea, we have the settlement in Cadiz, Spain. Small, maybe 20 or 30 Germans, very, very prosperous in settlement Cadiz beginning in the 1660s. I mean, it's, uh, so prosperous, in fact, that when I was in Cadiz doing research in 2005, I visited a local Catholic church. They were not allowed to have their own chapel in Cadiz, uh, being a Catholic, of course, uh, bastion of Catholicism. But they were so powerful and wealthy that uh, one family, especially in Cadiz, the, Zuc uh, the uh, Zucar, David Zukar family, not the, they're sometimes re confusedly referred to as the, the Zakarians. They're actually not the Zakarians. They're the Sh uh, Shakarians. The Shakarian family of Cadiz uh, had bought uh, special tiles, al azulejos, they call them in Spanish, blue mosaic tiles, for the decoration of the Church of Santa Maria in Cadiz, with Armenian inscriptions, and those mosaics, are, the tiles are still there in the church. They were given a special chapel for their own use. So, uh, and of course, the, the azulejos were uh, commissioned from Amsterdam, which is a thriving Armenian community, again, less than 100. So these are the settlements. So as to how, what these settlements and what this larger network might have felt and looked like for the average Jufan who's actually traveling and planning these networks to make a living, uh, I, I put together this map based on documentation that I came across in the uh, Archivo General de la Nación of Mexico City, the last place you would expect to find Jufan merchants. But interestingly enough, some of the most interesting documents are actually in Mexico City. I would argue the most ex exquisite documents are actually in Mexico City, and they are documents that pertain to the Inquisition, uh, the Inquisition in Manila. Manila was a Spanish colonial outpost. Right? If you wanted to succeed in Manila, and you happen to be an Armenian Christian, 
he was regarded as a schismatic by the, by the Catholic Church. If he were smart, like the Jofans were, he would visit the Inquisition office, confess, curse the Armenian Church left and right, convert to Catholicism, uh, probably temporarily, and then he would increase your chances of being prosperous in the middle. And this is what, in fact, a number of merchants, at the very least, 30 Jofas did in Manila in the Inquisition office, beginning in the 1720s. We have all their depositions, testimonials given to the Inquisition officer. The Inquisition officer would give them these questions that were formulaic in nature, that, would, uh, that are actually questions that, every, that answer every historian's dream. Exact questions that every historian would like to have, would, would have liked to have been posed to uh, 18th century merchants. Questions were begin begin like this: uh, What is your name? Where were you born? What were your parents' names? And uh, what religion did you belong to? And what religion do your parents belong? And then the next question would be: When did you leave your hometown? How long have you been traveling? Where have you visited? How long have you stayed in each place? And when did you arrive in this beautiful city of Manila? And lastly, what is the level of your education? Ideal questions. And these merchants, one by one, they answered these questions. And two merchants really stood out for the remarkable itineraries that they gave, responding to one of these questions and to which places they visited. And these merchants are Santiago de Barakir and Gregorio de Zacarias. They don't sound like Jofan names, but they're actually Jofan. Even the names are Jofan. Barakir is a Jofan name. I came across the same Santiago de Barakir 20 years later. He visited the Inquisition in 1725, I think, and he gave a very remarkable deposition. And I came across him in the 1740s in the uh, documents from Basra. By that time, he was a wealthy merchant. He had loaned money to the primate of Nijo. And his name was Johannes Bordi Barakieri. So we have like Miguel's, we have Javier's, lots of Spanish sounding names because some of these merchants actually changed names wherever they went but most of the time they chose names that were as close to their original names as possible. But in some cases we have, for instance, I don't know any Armenian community in the world that would name uh, their kids, uh, they would give it, uh, the name Alvise to their son. Alvise is a Venetian name. It's not even used by Italians. It's used exclusively by Venetians. It's the Venetian version of Luigi. Venetian, uh, local Venetian use. But we have Arvises in Jufa because of their connections to Venice. We have obviously Martins, we have all sorts of names. Obviously, Iranian Armenians were always rescuing the pride of the Armenians wherever we, they go. They have a particular talent for uh, naming, uh, using unusual names. And this is particularly the case with the Jufa. So, Santiago de Barakir, without uh, going too, off, too much off on a tangent, gave his uh, testimonial and he basically explained in detail his travels. He left at the age of 13, which is the average age. He was actually the youngest. The, the others I have are 16, <coughs> 17 <coughs> at the most, but most of them left by the time they were 16. And 16 was considered the legal age for Jofan, uh, according to documents from Amsterdam. So if Jofan was 16 years old, he was responsible already. He could be treated as an adult and be responsible for trade. And all of these merchants, including Santiago, mentioned that they had an education. They went to a business school in Jufa. In, in New Jufa. There was an MBA kind of school uh, for which the headmaster was uh, Constant Chubayetzi, who had his own manual as a textbook. And uh, essentially, uh, Santiago went to this school because he notes it in his testimonial, and he says, I went, I learned how to do math in Armenian, mathematics. I, I obviously, I, um, I, I'm fluent in my own mother tongue. I know how to read the Bible and so forth. And not only that, but Santiago was fluent in Italian and Dutch. And he had been learning Spanish and was able to do double entry accounting in Spanish. So, and of course, his travels took him north across Russia, uh, across Europe, even had a time to spend in Malta. I don't know, for what reason, Venice, the usual, all the usual places, haunts he visited. And then he went back, like many of these agents, these, these are uh, long distance uh, partners that I'm going to be talking about later on. Uh, like all of them, he went back 
to New Jufa a year or so after the leaving town to marry a bride, a local bride from his community, and then probably stayed for a year or two. He procreated and then took off again for 20, 30 years. They would be they would disappear for 20, 30 years. And of course, it's another it's an interesting question as to what they would do when they were away for 30 years. Because um, there are, there is evidence by uh, from European travelers and so on that some of these merchants or some of these uh, lowly merchants had wives in every port. <laughs> and probably they creolized as they went. So they, they probably married and procreated as they traveled. Uh, but most of them went back, worked in a visit to Jufa, had children, families, and then they traveled to, to be in, with the hopes of making it rich one day. The same with Gregorio Pizacarias. And in two cases we have, uh, in one case we have, I came across this unusual Jufa in Mexico City. He's already settled and established in Mexico City in the 1720s, he arrived in 1723. And interestingly enough, his name is Don Pedro de Zarate, probably Ara Petros, Ara Petros Borti Sarvati, but Don Pedro de Zarate. He's always walking around, according to the Inquisition document, with a white hat and very wary of meeting anyone from the Middle East. He stays away from Armenians or anybody from the Middle East. Until, of course, somebody snitched on him. And guess where the snitcher was from? He was an Armenian from Iran. Uh, his name was, I forget his first name, but something something uh, Giraganyan. He was working for the Dominicans in Acapulco, or in the Yucatan, sorry. And he had snitched on Don Pedro because he thought Don Pedro was one of these many Jofans who used to change religions like people change songs. So he had accused him of being a schismatic and of someone who had been uh, basically converted for the purpose of uh, personal gain. And of course, in this case, Don Pedro was a Catholic. He was born a Catholic. And luckily for him, for us, for me, he was snitched on because we have his deposition in the, in the, in the Inquisition archives. So, uh, okay, so now uh, the question, of course, arises as to how this very large global network of settlements was able to maintain its ethno religious and economic integrity for over 100 years. How did they do it? How was this network able to stay together? Why didn't it just crumble into different pieces? And to answer this question, uh, I rely on the work of Claude Markovitz in Paris, who has this new definition of, very interesting definition of what a trade network is. And basically, he says that a trade network is, uh, consists of a center, <coughs> usually a town, and a cluster of nodes around it. And the nodes are settlements. They are commercial settlements. And these settlements, are linked to the center and to each other. And they are linked to each other and to the center through what he calls the circulation of men and things. And by the circulation of men and things, he means the circulation, first and foremost, of uh, merchants and credit, like the Santiago de Barraquias, who are circulating constantly. Men, 99%, 100% of the men. We have very few cases of women circulating. And then we have priests, very important. Uh, uh, Component of the circulatory regime of New Jufan. Because the New Jufan network was not just a commercial network, it was also a religious network with its diocesan center in the church of, in the Old Savior's Monastery of New Jufa, a picture of which appears here. I actually had the honor of living in this compound back here somewhere. They were extremely generous to me, and if they are watching this, I'm very grateful to them that. They hosted me and they allowed me to photograph the documents because at that point I was concerned that there might be a war. This is in 2004, I went in 2005, January. And I photographed as many documents as I could. From 1595, the first document, to 1800. So if, God forbid, something were to happen, I have high resolution images of all these documents, like I have for all the other archives. So, uh, and of course, when you look at this, the first thing that crosses your mind is what does it look like? It looks like the mosque. And I think this is an interesting aspect. Uh, it's an analogy for the larger identity of these Jofa merchants. They were not the people who you, whom you could easily peg or place in a box. They were not simply Jofa, they were not simply Armenians. They were, first and foremost, members of the township of New Jofa before everything else. Before being Armenian, they were Jofas. They were a diaspora apart because everybody else compared to them didn't really measure up in terms of the cosmopolitan 
nature of their communities. The Jufans were the cream of the crop. But secondly, they were also members of whatever community they were. If they lived in India, they took on traits, cultural traits of their host societies. Uh, if they lived in Venice, they acted and behaved and looked like Venetians. If they were in Russia, they, they did similar. So, and if they were in Iran, obviously, most of them were in the Islamic Age world. Not just the Islamic, but the Islamic Age, which means the world influenced by Islamic cultural traditions, not just the religious tradition, not just religion, but cultural traditions. And in that sense, they were hardly distinguishable from fellow Muslim merchants. They wore a similar garb. They ate probably similar food. Their language was a, compos a, 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 a composite of uh, multiple languages. Jufa dialect has probably 60% vocabulary that consists of loan words. And I mean Jufa dialect used by the merchants, not just the Jufa dialect spoken in the township by the sedentary people. The merchants had a language that had <coughs> large doses of Persian, large doses of Ottoman Turkish, large doses of Arabic. Uh, sometimes all these were actually in one because Arabic and Turkish and uh, Persian shared the same vocabulary. And of course Hindustani, as well as a sprinkle of Tibetan. We have some Russian, we have lingua franca, French, Italian, and so on. All of this mixed together with indigenous Chufu dialect terminology and the, more, uh, the grammar of Chufu dialect itself creates the unique kind of cosmopolitan mosaic of a language known as Chufu dialect. So it's, like the church, it is a reflection of this larger cosmopolitan identity, uh, usually borrowing creatively and selectively from different cultures. So the church itself, the headquarters in the Old Seafrance Monastery, the primate staff, the churches in India, the Indian Ocean, all the churches belong to the diocesan center of New Chufa. They are appointed. The primate usually sent three or four priests to these churches on uh, some on on, a, on, a, on the basis of several years. I suppose he would change uh, the, the, the priests or the deacons. So Madras would have four. From time to time, the primate would send four deacons or church or priests to Madras to look after the community's religious needs. Right? But in addition to that, of course, the church like the merchants, was interested in one thing that all of us are interested in, which is money. They were interested in having wealthy chufans who would pass away overseas, leave part of their uh, wills uh, to the church because the church needed to survive. And so this is also, this is why the circulation of priests is an important component of, chufan, of the chufan network. And lastly, but certainly not least, the circulation of information in the form of business letters, correspondence, family letters, and so forth, but also information in the form of travel uh, itineraries, uh, uh, textbooks uh, for long distance trade, and so on, like the textbook that Constant Trubayetzi had written called Ashkarajo. Okay, these all circulated with the merchants. So all of these together circulated from the center of neutral for all of these items that I just mentioned have their origin at the center of the Jufa. The Jufa network was a very monocentric network. It didn't have multiple centers, just one center. So if something happened to the center, chances are if it was fatal, the rest of the network would probably collapse. But it has also advantages. Uh, in any case, this is how it, the network functioned. And this is why it maintained its integrity for over 100 years. Now, I will close with a few words about the contract that made all of this possible the long distance partnership contract without which none of this, without which the ne network that, uh, uh, that moved and circulated uh, precious metals, silver, gold, raw Iranian stock, uh, Indian textiles, diamonds, rubies, uh, along with other commodities, probably spices at some point, all of this was facilitating the movement of all of these commodities and things and men and capital, of course, that I mentioned. All these things were circulated and moved around the network through the facilitation of great families based in Jufa and through, most importantly, through a long distance partnership contract known as the Comenda. Now, the Comenda is actually not very difficult to understand. It's a simple contract and it's, bas it's basically a contract between two parties. One party is the capitalist party, the party that has the capital. The other party is the party that usually doesn't have capital, but has the skill and has the willingness to travel like Santiago de Barraquil for 30 years, usually working for a wealthy capitalist merchant residing in Jufa. <coughs> usually, <coughs> the capitalist merchant 
usually known as a Khoja or an Aga or a Tev, would give either money or commodities for this lowly menial merchant who wanted to become wealthy one day, like the Santiago's of the world. Santiago would receive the money or the commodities and he would be off, like at the age of 13, and he would go for 20, 30 years and the contract is open-ended. So basically two parties, one provides the capital, the other provides the labor, they mix it together and they have a partnership. At the end of 30 years or 20 years of traveling, the agent, the factor, known in, in Jufa dialects as the Inker, and the contract is known as the Inker Akir, the agent would have to return back like a bee to the hive, Indian Jufa. And the first thing he would do would be to hand over his Ruznama, which is basically a da daily diary of a, in the form of an accounting ledger, double, double entry accounting, to the master, to the Aga in, in New Jufa, to the Khoja. And they would go over it together, they would decide uh, after a meticulous examination of all the entries and debits and credits of the accounts, they would decide what the profit was. Once the profit had been arrived at, according to the contract, and usually the contract specified a particular kind of ratio of uh, splitting of the profit. So, most, 99% of the time, you have 25% of the profit going to the Santiago character. The guy who did all the work, 30 years of traveling, being a backyard all over the place, he would get only 25%. The master in Jufa would keep the rest. If the agent was really good, if he had a solid reputation, he was trustworthy and so on, and the agent, the master, would not have to intervene all the time by sending him letters of instruction, saying, oh, sell this, don't sell this, etc. If he could do all those things by himself, he could maybe ask a higher ratio. He could go for as much as the most we know is 66, he could go for 33.333%. That's the highest. 66.66% would go to the, to, the, uh, to the capitals. So it's an unfair, it's a raw deal in some ways. But for the time, for the period that we're dealing with, this is the best that agents could hope for. And usually they, were, they got into these contracts because after 20, 30 years of working, one day they would become khojas themselves. And in many cases they did. So now, in closing, the question naturally arises, another question as to something I mentioned earlier, trust. How did they, I mean, if you are a Khoja in Ninjufa, let's say you are Khoja Minas, you are one of the wealthiest mercantile families, you preside over one of the wealthiest mercantile families in Jufa, you have the capital, you have the commodities, you have everything. And you find a meanly uh, uh, kind of uh, merchant who wants to become wealthy. You find the Santiago. You want to give him, let's say, hypothetically, half a million dollars worth of merchandise or credit. He's going to go and trade for you in Tibet. Why would you, why would you trust this guy? I mean, in theory, uh, Santiago could spit here. The minute he skipped down, he could, he could never come. He would never return. So if he has five hundred thousand dollars investment with him, he could decide, well, why should I go back? I can embezzle this money. It's all mine. Nobody is going to send the police, the Interpol, after. But the reason why it almost always worked, with no, with two or three exceptions in the archives that we know, where cheating was in fact uh, caught, uh, is because there was a system that the Jufans used, which I term in my book, trust in gossip, but bastinado when needed. So basically, gossip is important because it establishes reputations. Even today, the Armenian word for gossip, as you know, is the Armenian word for reputation today, hambal, right? In the classical, in classical Armenian, in Chufa dialect, before the 19th century, the Armenian word hambal was actually synonymous with gossip. Hambal meant gossip. It meant rumors, it meant hearsay, it meant all sorts of things that translate into that gossip. Same, similarly, in European languages, the word for gossip is, in the pre-19th century period, fama. It's also the same word that's used for reputation. So gossip and reputation go hand in hand. Somebody's reputation is either, is either built or destroyed by what people say about him. So if the person had a good reputation, if people said good things about him and so on, the agent, you know, Jofa would trust them more, more than likely. But that wasn't by itself enough. Just to be on the safe side, they had another mechanism which I call the bastinado effect, which is that if the merchant cheated you, first of all, the merchant wouldn't cheat you because he would, they would only hire Jofans. 
for their for their trade. The partners have always every single case of Jufan. I haven't come across one case of a non Jufan, even a non Jufan Armenian <coughs> working for a Jufan as a Ringer. Not one case. And the reason is also uh, pretty easy to understand. It's because if you hire only your own kind from Jufa, it means that the families are in Jufa. Mm -hmm. So when you leave, the family is in the care of the, in the care of the capitalist. And according to Jufa commercial law, the capitalist is obliged to look after the family. He is by, expected by the community and by the law to look after their welfare, to feed them, to give them money, and so on, while they're Male member is away for uh, for dozens of years. The, the master looks after their their um, well, male male member is not the right choice in that sense, but that case. But whether, while the men were away, uh, so in any case, um, so this of course meant that if Santiago is away, he's going to think ten times before he skips down. He might end up pocketing half a million dollars, but he will also think, well, if I skip down, my family is in Jofa, They're essentially hostages. So he had to go. He has to go back. And if he goes back and he doesn't hand, he doesn't submit an accounting ledger that's exactly accurate, it will be according to Jofan commercial law. He was. It was perfectly normal for the Jofans to treat Santiago as a common criminal, which meant throwing him into jail, uh, bastinadoing the hell out of him for one year, feeding him with only bread and water for a whole year until he coughed up the money or until his family somehow made amends. So it's a very effective system. You have 100% delivery on trust, which is good because you don't have any unnecessary expenses in lit litigation. You don't have to go after the, someone in the courts. You waste a lot of money. A lot of corporations to this day waste money in litigation. So you immediately increase the profit margin. But the downside to this, of course, is that if you're like the Jufan community with 30,000 members in 1690s and its height, uh, then at some point, we are going to be running out of agents. How many Santiago's can you generate? How many of them can you train in the business school in Jufa, in the all-service uh, monastery company? 200, 300? At some point, you're going to run out of agents. So if you only hire your own kind, I think in the final instance, it's not good for business. It's still good advice today, which is that basically it's always in our interest to work with the other, with the other, mm -hmm. and to find ways in which you can find mutually agreeable terms and trust relations with non armenians in this case with the non jufans And so uh, one of the arguments I make in the book is that even if the Jufa network had not collapsed in 1747, it actually collapsed for other reasons, not for the reason that had to do with the contract. It collapsed because of mili military conquest, of uh, extortion, and of looting of Isfahan by Nadir Shah Afshar, who came to power after the Safavids had collapsed. So it collapsed in 1747, 48, and it took two, maybe two or three decades for the entire network to slowly crumble in India and other places. And they also had other problems with the English East India Company. But even if they, none of that happened, even if the, everything was perfect, Nadir Shah did not exist, I, I, I argue in the book that they would have still had serious problems down the road because the method in which they traded was not very good, was not very conducive for expanding their network. It would have, at some point, uh, restricted expansion. So if it's good in trust, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good for expansion. Uh, so I will end with this, but I, I can show you. Uh, I'll, I'll actually answer the three questions that I said I was going to raise as to why the Jofans are important, not just for world historians, but for Armenian historians, for Armenian history. And the three reasons, at the very least, are, first, if you think about the most important centers of Armenian education, higher education, in the 19th century, what would be the three most important places you would think of? Colleges. Uh, if you haven't already heard this talk, I've given this talk many times, but if you haven't, what, what would be the most important uh, schools? Lazarian Institute. Lazarian, Lazarian Institute, yes, exactly. Number one, actually, number I would say number two, but number one would be in my favorite city in the galaxy. Mahitara Murad Rafael Kovar, right? Lazarian Institute, followed lastly by the Marta Sinagan Jemaran in Kalkar. What do all these three brilliant places have in common? They are all established by Jufan, bankrolled by Jufan capital. So that's one reason, very important, as to why the Jufans are important. Another reason is because if you look at all the books printed between 1512 and 1800, 1300 
separate individual titles. 99 point, I don't know what percent, a very large percent were financed by merchants. And out of all the merchants, a significant sum were actually financed by the Jewels. Some printing presses were entirely paid for by the Jewels. The first printing press in HP Alzin, Simon Yerevanzi's press, 1771 or 70, established, paid for, and taken care of entirely by a Jufan merchant in Madras by the name of uh, Mukel uh, De Romanesian, I think, or Hoji Jets. He even paid, he paid 16,000 rupees to establish even a paper mill on the grounds of the HMAT. Jufan money. So, uh, so there are many reasons why they told. In fact, I would argue, and I'm going to argue in my third book, that the period from 1500 to 1800 should, in theory, is the early modern period, it should also be called the Jufan age in Armenian history, because most of the important things that happened during this period, to a large extent, were financed by the wrong business mercantile capital that the Jufan elite uh, created. So I will end here. I will take any questions you have, but I'll show you firstly also uh, the first newspaper in the world, again, Jufan, on a Jufan newspaper, or a Jufan press, uh, Astara in, in Madras. We have, uh, these are samples of uh, the correspondence that I mentioned. These are envelopes of letters, 18th century envelopes, with the addressee entry in Jufan Armenian script. Vastudov, Hasse, I, Christosina, Tudriar, Elia, Sibor, D, Amena, Baizar, or Goizar, something, Sahat, Dorvat, Ahaminasi, I, Karkata, and then in Arabic script. And then only that five letters in Arabic script. So, and this is the Comenda contract, the earliest we have, of 1659 in the <coughs> uh, And I will end here. So, thank you, and I'll, I'll take it off. Uh, 